If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people who have experienced paranormal activity, what is your story? So I used to rent a townhouse in the woods with my ex. One night, I'm out on duty when she calls me at about 3 in the morning. I'm thinking, oh my god, somebody broke in. I have to race home and help, but it seems. The wooden baby gate we used to keep the puppy downstairs flew from the base of the stairs. All the way up the stairs, I hit the ceiling, leaving a mark, and landed in a mangled mess. The puppy was locked in her cage all night, so she couldn't have done it. And all the doors and windows were locked from the inside. Later that month, we were in the kitchen having a chat when, in front of our very eyes, this big, heavy feeder we used for the cat, which was on the countertop as I'd just cleaned it, rotated 90 degrees upright onto its side. And then gently another 90 so as to be upside down. It barely made a tap as it landed. This feeder was heavy. When I tried to recreate this, it made a very loud crash. How could it rotate with only a tap? More crazy things happened, too. I would enter the kitchen, and then the silverware drawer would bang super loud. The animals would stare at a corner of the room and back away slowly. A dead bolted door would be wide open as soon as you turned your back on it. Oh, and the nightmares, man, you would not believe. When I was in college, I lived in an apartment complex. Every once in a while, at like 2 in the morning, I would hear breaking glass. It was clear as day when it happened, there was no doubt it was a window breaking event. I never found any broken glass anywhere around the apartment. My younger brother would come out and party with us, and once or twice he came busting into my room, thinking someone was breaking in. Finally, one night, my girlfriend stayed over. She would kick and push in her sleep and, at some point, nudged me, and I woke up. When I looked over at her, she wasn't asleep. She was sitting at the foot of the bed, facing away from me. When I said her name, she stood up and walked out of the room. I looked around and realized that she was still lying next to me in bed. That was the only time I saw anything in that place, but I heard the sounds pretty consistently. When I was younger, maybe like five. I went to bed, and I woke up to the sound of something whispering. I thought nothing of it until I heard hey, PSST, and I looked up and saw a black dog with yellow eyes standing on two legs. I started screaming and crying and yelling for my parents, and when they came up, the thing hid behind a chair in my room. I was so scared that I slept with my parents for a week and never saw that thing again. I had multiple dreams about it, though. It always had this power that it could make me freeze and not be able to move, and he would always do it in front of my parents, and they never did anything. Really creepy shit. I was babysitting my parents' friend's child. They were out for dinner, and someone had to take care of the baby, and I volunteered. I was about 11 to 12 at the time and wasn't that close to the baby. The house they lived in was very old but had been refurbished to look nicer. It was around 7.30 when I put the baby to bed, and then I was just chilling on the couch for an hour before I heard something. It sounded like floorboards creaking. It was around 8.30 now, but since this baby was no taller than a foot, it couldn't have been her. It was a single family house, and the nearest neighbors were about 10 yards away. Nobody was home except me and the baby. I went upstairs to make sure the baby was okay, but she was sitting up in her crate just staring down a hallway through a separate door that was slightly creaked open. I went over to see what she was looking at. I opened the door all the way, and a cold wind swept my ankles, no windows open and no ventilation in this hall, and what seemed like a figure's shadow creeped into the other room. I grabbed the baby, went straight downstairs, and locked her and me in a small reading room until around 12 p.m. when the parents came home. Never babysitting in a house from 1920 again. I was babysitting a friend's baby three years ago, and it was around three months old. They went on a date night while I stayed and made sure the baby didn't die, I guess. Around 2 a.m., I checked the baby monitor, and to my horror, I saw a hand in the crib. I knew I was home alone, and it was a small house anyway. I grabbed a baseball bat from the shed, ran in there, and turned the light on. There was nothing there, but I made the baby cry. I know I saw something, I wasn't even tired, high, or anything. I couldn't sleep knowing that I saw something there. I took the baby and put it in the same bed as me, and I slept. He started getting very fussy whenever I tried putting him back in the crib. At 4 AM, I couldn't sleep and looked at the baby monitor and saw two hands now on the crib. And I'm not taking the piss right now, but I swear one of the hands had their finger up. I told the parents, and they thought I was just tired. I was coming home from work one night, and to get to my house, I usually take a route that takes me past an old Civil War graveyard. I was on the phone with my mom at the time because I hate driving alone at night, and I guess being on the phone made me feel a bit safer. All of a sudden, 
right when I got to the graveyard, my mom's voice cut out mid-sentence, and these weird, guttural noises started coming through my phone. I don't know how to describe it other than to say it sounded like a lot of people talking all at once in a language I've never heard before. At first, I thought maybe something was wrong with my phone, so I decided to restart it. That should have fixed it, right? Sound couldn't possibly come out of it with it off, right? Wrong. When I told you, I almost threw my phone out the window when those noises and voices were still coming out of it. My phone was completely powered off, and the noises and voices were still there. I literally had to take the battery out of my phone for it to finally stop. To this day, I don't know what the hell that was that night, and I don't think I even want to know. Needless to say, I took a different route home after that. About a decade ago, when I was still in high school, I always used to bike to school in the early hours of the morning. My road led me through these beautiful forested areas, past meadows for livestock, and through tranquil country roads. I loved biking there before the sun came up in the winter. The road is split in places. There's one lane for bikes, a small ditch, and a larger lane for forest rangers to drive their cars along. One time I was riding along the bike lane when suddenly, on the car lane, I saw a light. About head level. Very bright, but not blinding. It was slightly behind me and moving at a steady pace along with me. I wasn't scared, more like unsettled, due to how suddenly it had appeared and how it was slowly moving my way. I stepped it up and got out of there. I didn't look back. I rode that road for years and never saw it again. Not long ago, I even hiked there in the middle of the night, hoping to see it again. I figured maybe my returning to the area after so long would trigger it to happen again. Maybe it would recognize me or my intent to see it again. But no luck. It doesn't have to be supernatural. It could have been ball lightning. Even if it was, I feel privileged to have witnessed it. Ball lightning or wisp, it was a unique experience. One I really wish I could experience again. So in my dream, I was outside my grandma's home. She was dead when this happened. I saw her smiling creepily and standing near the door. Her hair was also weird, like here and there and sticking up too. I didn't mind it until one day, early in the morning, I was outside my house, and up above the roof, I saw a full black figure sitting, more like in a toddler crawling position, and it was gone the next moment. The weird thing was that it had the same haircut. And another time, I was home alone. I came from a shower and was wiping my face when I saw a hand, again full black, on my shoulder, but obviously no one was there. To this day, I don't know what to think of it. I'm not even sure if it's paranormal or if my brain is playing tricks. So for me, we were out chilling and having a few beers by the river. It was getting dark out, so my friends and I wanted to head out before it was too dark to see the trail. On our way back, we saw something. Something that looked similar to a human. We were worried about the person, and if they were okay, we went to shine the flashlight on the person, except there was no face. I didn't see the face because my friend was closer and I was a few feet away. My friend said it looked static when I asked him about it, and the person bolted. I went from laying down to a standing position faster than any human I've seen and ran off. It was tall, too. I was over 7 feet tall, if I had to guess, it was super dark out. The way it ran reminded me of something that was a cross between robotic and the way that the bionic man ran. It ran away faster and quieter than a human. All the hair on my body stood on end, similar to the feeling that you would get when a thunderstorm is out. Except that there were almost no clouds out. All of my friends and I were freaked out, and the hair on all of our arms was standing straight up. I never had such a strong feeling of terror and dread before. I went fishing one night, and on my way back to the vehicle at about 1am, I had my headlamp on. I was walking on the trail when something caught my eye in front of me, and as I looked up, there was a man walking towards me with jeans, a white vest, a blue shirt unbuttoned, and his fishing bag and rod slung over his shoulder. I stopped dead, and he carried on walking and went straight through me. I lived in a house with a few ghosts, a little girl, a dog, and an old man. Some days I would walk into my room, and all my cupboards and drawers would be wide open. I saw the old man sitting at the base of my bed one night, and the little girl was from the swimming pool, she drowned there and didn't like people being in the pool after sunset. The dog would bark when someone rang the doorbell, and it would urinate on my dad's bedroom carpet. You could stand there and watch the puddle form. The trash bin would open and close all night, rather loudly. My brother also used to be attacked and used to have scratches all over his body. He would stand in front of the mirror and see and feel the scratches forming. He used to feel the spirits climbing on and off my bed some nights. My brother and I have always seen and felt supernatural spirits. We can even drive past a house and tell you if it has something inside it. I wish I could communicate with the dead, though, one day.
one house I lived in when I was a teenager. I had stuff go flying off a wall shelf unit. Helium balloons we had left over from a party would somehow teleport around the house despite having no path of getting ahead of you. It would be in one room on the second floor, and then all of a sudden, in the laundry room, the basement was bobbing up and down like it was being tugged on. I was alone there one night and decided to go out. I locked the house up, and my parents were on our boat over an hour's drive away. I came home to the dining room with chairs stacked up along with other kitchen items in a magnificent way, leaning against a ceiling fan. I would routinely see the light in the hall turn on and foot shadows under my closed door walking back and forth at night, despite hearing both my parents snoring in their room. The worst was one night I had a couple friends over, and I lived in the basement apartment of this house at this time. We heard the door knob outside start jiggling. Not expecting anyone, I went over and flung the door open to find no one there. This door knob giggling kept happening, and we all, being freaked out, just ignored it. After a while, there was pounding on all the walls around us. Just going in a circle around us. My friends decided to leave. I was left alone for the rest of the night, hearing footsteps walking up and down the stairs to my basement apartment. Later on, we had a tenant take up that basement apartment. He would say he would routinely see an old lady just standing and staring at him down there. The black stick men phenomenon. I had some experiences as a child that I would consider paranormal. After my teenage years, I never really opened up about them to people because of how crazy it sounds. It wasn't until several years ago that I started researching on the internet and found I wasn't alone in seeing these strange creatures. I know it might sound silly to some, but this is what I experienced. When I was growing up, I had a best friend who lived down the street. We lived in a quiet, small town where her dad was always working. I would walk to her house every day after school, and we would often take walks, walk to the liquor store to buy candy, etc. I would often see a stick man following us, peeking out from behind her couch, etc. He was all black and changed sizes. Sometimes the size of a small cat, other times taller than a normal sized man. I felt very scared of him and felt he was mischievous at best, perhaps evil. I finally got the courage up to tell my best friend, and she admitted to seeing him too. I always got the feeling he was the same one every time, not different stick men. One time he appeared in the shape of a stick figure horse, like a bad child's drawing. I always believed him to be somehow following me and watching me. Until my best friend passed away suddenly in our senior year of high school. She had a genetic heart condition that nobody, including herself, knew about. I've never seen what we called stick man ever since. I believe now perhaps he was some form of grim reaper awaiting his time to take my friend. I don't know if that's really the case, but it seems odd that sightings of him disappeared after she passed. When I was younger, I was a smoker. I mean a pretty heavy, and I don't just mean my weight, one at that. At the time, my grandmother also smoked. It was either a few days before or after Christmas because I remember the tree being up. My cousin lived down the street, a few houses down from me, coincidentally. This was a night where he was sleeping over. We would get to play on the PlayStation. Which would be a great night, or so we thought. My grandparents were both sleeping at this point in time, since it was pretty late. We both smoked, and my grandmother smoked Sonoma regular 100s. They were her favorite brand before she quit smoking. Well, my cousin and I had a brilliant idea to go upstairs while she was asleep to nab ourselves a good old-fashioned cancer stick from her pack. We went up the stairs, being quiet like mice. When we reached the door, I pushed the door open. Of course, it was me who opened the door. Because it was my house he was staying at, right? Wonderful. Continuing on, I pushed open the door, trying to keep it quiet. As soon as that door swung open, a black figure jumped at us. It was like a real-life horror movie jump scare. We all love them. But this? Duck no. It made us both nearly crap ourselves. We bolted back down the stairs, ignoring the idea of staying quiet at this point. Once we were in another room, away from the stairs altogether, we were both pale. We both saw it. It wasn't one of those times where one of us would see something. Whatever it was, it showed itself to both of us. That'll teach us to keep smoking and try to take a cigarette again. We dubbed what we saw that night the Christmas demon. Pretty creepy stuff. Middle of the night. I woke up suddenly from a deep sleep. There was a light or lights coming through the window, which faced a blank wall, that was so blindingly bright, as though someone had placed stadium-grade floodlights right outside. I tried to get up, but was completely paralyzed from head to toe. I could only stare and blink. This went on for about 10 seconds, which felt like an hour. Then, nothing. I woke up, it was a regular morning. I have never had anything like that happen before or since. If it was a dream, then it was the most realistic and terrifying dream I've ever had, 
since I've never had a lucid dream or anything like that. I am convinced that it was real, whatever the ducking duck that was. When I lived in my previous house, I lived in a finished basement with a room that made you walk past the laundry room. Almost every night when I would walk past the laundry room, I would see a tall pale woman in a long white dress and long black hair float by at the same speed I was walking, and when I got to the end of the doorframe, she would disappear into the wall. Well, once we started packing to move out, my uncle came over to help with the move. We were clearing out the laundry room, bear with me here. I was standing inside the laundry room facing out, and my uncle was outside the laundry room facing in. While we were packing, I saw my uncle turn milk white, freeze while bending down, and lock his eyes on something behind me. I ask what's wrong, and he says he saw someone walk behind me and disappear into the wall. And without a beat, I asked what they looked like, and he proceeded to describe someone who looked exactly like the description I made earlier. At that second, my mother comes downstairs and tells us we're ready to leave. Since then, another one of my uncles moved in, and I've visited, but I haven't seen the white lady since. But the look on my uncle's face will frighten me for the rest of my life. This lasted for about three to four months. I would wake up every night and feel something watching me intensely, it was almost always 3 to 5 am. I had to go to my parents' bedroom with my pillow and sleep on the floor. I would also get sleep paralysis. This dark thing would be standing in front of me, in the corner of my room, or behind me. My mom felt like that too, but not as much as me. My dad and my brother were absolutely fine and felt nothing. I was scared at first, but I had gotten used to it by then. Also, whenever I went past my front door hallway, I forgot what it was called in English, I would see that same completely dark, tall shadow thing at the corner of my eyes. A shaman came to our house and said there was a powerful dark spirit in our house. It wasn't powerful at first, but it got stronger with the women's fear. The spirit only affects women, we had to do a ritual, and it's been fine ever since. When I was around 22, around 2007, I was driving home to visit my parents, and I was really tired. I had been driving all day. I was getting in late, it was probably close to 1 am. I stopped at a stop sign as I was getting closer to their house, and I sat there for a couple seconds because I was trying to remember which direction to go because they had moved to this house after I left home and hadn't lived there long, I had only been there a few times. And all of a sudden, I got this super creepy feeling that someone was looking at me. I felt like they were right next to my driver's side window, but when I looked, no one was there. So I was about to start moving when I gave a quick glance in my rearview mirror and saw a flash of a girl in my brake lights. It looked as if she had been standing there, but as soon as I looked up, she ducked across the back of the car, towards the passenger side, into the bushes by the side of the road. I don't believe in the paranormal, never have, and I typically don't scare easily. But it startled the duck out of me. I got out and called for someone, and there was no sound. Nothing. I got back inside and drove to their house but it was the most freaked out creeping feeling I've ever felt. There was something about how quickly she moved that seemed uncanny, and even though all I really saw was a flash of her moving out of view, it was like I had a visual of her standing there for a second burned in my memory. It was as if my eyes saw her, but my mind didn't quite register it before she moved. And the image is of someone who just doesn't seem right, like not right for the time or place, something I can't put my finger on was just off about her. I don't know what or who I saw, but it's stuck with me ever since. I was about 16 and home alone one night at my stepdad's house. Everyone had gone out for the night except me. One thing you need to know about this household is that it's in a pretty rural area, in a little village where everyone knows each other and a lot of family members live in the same town. Because of this, no one would ever use the front door. Everyone who came over would just come through the garden, use the back door, and walk right in. So it's about 10 p.m., I'm watching TV, and the doorbell rings. It startled me a bit. Who could that be at this hour? So I look out the window to get a full view of the front doorstep. No one's there. As I'm looking out, the bell rings again, but there's no one there to ring it. My whole body becomes red hot with adrenaline and fear, and I'm frozen to my seat as it rings again. And again. I run to grab my phone to try and call my mom to come home because I'm scared shless. No answer. The ringing stops. About an hour later, my parents come home, and I freak out and tell them what happened and I'm pissed at them for not answering the phone. My stepdad chuckles and says, oh yeah, that's my wife. It happens sometimes. His previous wife and partner for years and years had died a few years ago. He said he tried to have the doorbell fixed only to figure out there's nothing wrong with it. Their theory is that when the doorbell rings, it's hers. Reminding them she's still with them. I grew up in a house that originally served as an old folks home. 
At night, the whole house would pop and crack. It sounded like people were walking up and down the stairs all night. My mom was always aware that the house was haunted. My dad said it was just the house settling. The house in 1984 was 100 years old. One night, I woke up to the sound of a door slamming. I walked down the hall and peeked around the corner, looking down the stairs. At the bottom of the stairs was a closet, the door was open about 6 to 8 inches, and there was a human face looking at me from inside the closet. I ran into the bathroom and tried to calm down. Finally, I mustered the courage to come out of the bathroom and look down the stairs again. Nothing there. There were many experiences in that house that are harder to explain. Not my experience, but my cousin had a terrifying experience on a county road at around 2 a.m. She worked nights as a community nurse and would often take this particular route to save time. It was quite an isolated road with no lights, no nearby houses, just farmland on one side and the edge of the moors on the other side. Now it was rare to see another car on this road, let alone a pedestrian, and my cousin was surprised to see a figure standing halfway down this road. She described this figure as leaning towards the fence, with their backs to the road, and wearing a long cloak or coat. She decided to pull over to see if this person needed help, but as soon as she got out of the car, the hairs on the back of her neck stood up. It was pitch black outside, and she could hear someone crying but couldn't see anything. So she grabbed her torch and shone it towards the sound of the crying. As soon as the light hit the crying figure, the person turned their head towards my cousin, and they had no face. Terrified by this point, my cousin jumped straight back in her car and drove to the next village. She called the police to let them know she had seen a girl by the side of the road who may need help. Incidentally, her colleague had been five minutes behind her and confirmed he hadn't seen anyone on this road. I was telling my mother the above story, and she knows of another encounter. Her friend was walking along this road one night. She had been at a neighboring party but had missed the last bus. Not wanting to spend the night, she decided to take the shortcut home across this road. She was accompanied by her husband, and she had a torch to see the way. Halfway down this route, they could hear crying on the other side of the road. She turned her torch towards the crying and saw a cloaked figure with no face. They immediately ran all the way home, never once looking back. I lived in a haunted house for a year. At this time, it was just me and my three sisters. Ages 13, 5, and 2, I was 10. My older sister and I were home from school with a stomach bug. My mom had to go get my 5-year-old sister from school and asked us to watch our youngest sister. We were sitting in the living room, and she was eating some snacks and had a sippy cup of water. The top of the cup must have not been screwed on tight enough because, when she knocked it over, water spilled everywhere. My older sister went to the kitchen to get some napkins to clean it up. When she came back, she handed me some of the napkins, and we both started cleaning. We were on our hands and knees, wiping up the water, when we started to hear banging coming from the second floor. We both paused, looked at each other, and said nothing. But we both had that look of you heard that too, right? We stayed silent and kept cleaning. Then again, another bang. At this point, we stand up and are still silent, just staring at the ceiling. Then came the giggles. We heard little kids upstairs laughing. Then the laughter turned to singing. It sounded like a children's choir singing. My sister scooped up the baby, and we ran outside. It was a clear day out that day, but I remember once we got outside, it started to rain. We had no choice but to go back inside. We stayed on the front porch until my mom got home. We saw things in that house that I still have nightmares about, 20 years later. But for some reason, giggling and singing bothered me the most. When I was a teenager, I went on a hike in South Central Pennsylvania by myself in the Appalachian Mountains. It was a day I was playing hooky, so there was nobody else there at the small trail. At least that I could see. You had to drive there, there was no foot traffic. I was young and had been talking, singing, and horsing around the whole time, totally unconcerned. Yelling things off the top of the mountain, etc. On my way down from the mountaintop, I heard my dad's voice call my name and ask for help. I thought I was having a stroke and stopped and almost started to follow, thinking, what is my dad doing here? Did he follow me or something? And then I came to my senses and told myself, my dad is sitting in his office, like an hour or more away. I heard it two more times in the space of a minute or two, call me by name and tell me to come here and help me. It sounded so insistent, like it was urgent, and it was without a doubt my father's voice. I have never run so ducking fast. I used to do this hike in bare feet, and I remember ducking my feet up and hurrying down the mountain. I never went back, and to this day, I don't know what the duck that was. I immediately drove to my dad's office, and he was sitting at his desk working. I don't remember if I told him what I experienced at the time or not. 
I lived in a haunted apartment for a year. The apartment was 12 feet by 8 feet. I started having these reoccurring dreams of a young woman asking me to follow her and thought nothing of it, but I never followed her in my dreams. One night I follow her in the dream, and she crosses a stream, and I stop. Nothing weird about that except for the guy across the stream loading a clip into his gun, cocking the gun, and then discharging the clip over and over. I wake up from my dream to see a shadowy figure dripping wet in the doorway to my bathroom. Freak out and look away to see the same man at the foot of my bed with the gun. I throw the sheets on me and look back to the bathroom, she's gone. Look back at the foot of my bed, and he's gone. Time goes on, and the dreams are now every time I go to sleep, but only at my apartment. One night I wake up to my TV turning on and flashing through the channels, with the volume continually getting louder. I tried my remote, but it didn't work. I try the buttons on the TV, but nothing, so I unplug the TV and go to bed. I wake up in the morning, plug in my TV, and sure enough, it's in the 200 somewhere with the volume cranked. The weird thing is that the TV shouldn't reach those numbers, and when I changed channels to get the TV back, I couldn't get back to those channels. As time goes on, I start having lights go on and off. My radio would turn on and change channels. Bulbs in the apartment would explode or turn on their own at night, and towards the end, it was day and night. I even started to see the dripping girl on a weekly basis around the apartment. The biggest event came when I finally followed the girl through the whole dream. I woke up because of the light flickering around in my apartment to see a hooded man at the foot of my bed. Thinking someone has broken into my apartment, I lunge at them from my bed, and we start exchanging blows, trashing my apartment. We square off, and he manages to reach out his hand and just touch me in the chest with two fingers. My whole body shuts down, and I fall on my back. He then proceeds to crawl up on my body and stand on my chest. I ask, what the duck do you want? Leave me alone. Figure disappears, and I lay on the floor till morning and head to class. I come home, and my place is trashed. I know what you're all thinking, and no, I don't do drugs and wasn't taking drugs when this happened. Other people experience the lights, but only one other person ever saw the girl. When I was in my early 20s, I stayed the night at two of my friends' houses. They broke out the Ouija board around midnight. Almost immediately, the board started spelling out that I needed to leave immediately and how it hated me. I didn't believe in the supernatural aspect of it, but I didn't think it was my friends being that vicious to me either. It just kept sending really horrible messages for about 30 minutes. The final message was that if I had taken its advice and left earlier, I would have died in a car accident. Completely unnerved, I slept between my friends all night in one bed. When I got home the next day, My mom described really bizarre behavior for my cat from midnight until 1am my Siamese, to lose, kept running down our upstairs hallway and flinging herself full force against my closed bedroom door. She also made this really loud, desperate meow. My parents were actually worried she was going to hurt herself because she was so violent. I truly believe that she was trying to get to me to keep me from harm. She never did anything like that ever again. This one time, when I was little, I was lying in bed with my right ear buried in my pillow. I was suddenly jolted awake by this roar that sounded like it was going directly into my right ear. I woke up startled and confused and began scanning my room for anything, as my mind was almost in panic mode. When I looked to my right, I saw this little boy standing next to me. He was glowing blue, but that wasn't the first thing I noticed about him. He looked sad, and I remember feeling bad for him. After a minute, I tried to lean closer to him and even muttered out a faint hey, but as I did, he disappeared. A few days later, I told this story to my mother, who then informed me that the people who owned the house before us had a son who died when he was five in a car accident. However, it wasn't near the house. I should also note that our house has been renovated since we moved in, and a second floor was added. My current theory is that the boy finally found his way back home and realized that his old home was gone. He came to me because I was the new boy in the house. Growing up, my family moved around quite a bit, due to divorces and stuff, renting, moving to permanent homes, etc. In my childhood home, my brother and I would regularly play in the basement, however, one room made both of us unexplainably uneasy, we didn't like to walk by it at the end of the hallway, wouldn't use the bathroom by it, would never leave each other alone in the basement, etc. It was a negative, heavy feeling that neither of us could describe at such a young age. This room was our guest bedroom, we never had guests stay the night, so it was always unoccupied. There was a bedroom set with an old wooden frame bed and chest. It came from my dad's family and he always kept it around despite my mom's protests and wanting to change the room to something more useful. Years later, talking to my dad about my dislike for this room and the negative presence I felt around it, he told me his stories within this house. 
he used to use the bathroom across the hall from the room and would leave the door cracked since no one was down there anyways, and he would always see something going past the door like someone going past the door up and down the hallway. My brother, as a baby, would look over his shoulder while being held, staring at something and sometimes giggling at an empty space in the room. My dad eventually yelled at it to get the duck out, and after that, my brother never laughed or stared at empty spaces, and my dad only felt its presence in the room and in the basement hall. So obviously, at this point, I conclude that this entity has a connection to my dad. So later in my early teens, my parents are divorced, and my dad moves out, taking this furniture with him. We end up not being in a good place, disliking each other, arguing, and causing a rift between us. This presence was always felt to me around this bedroom set, and once we moved, the negative, heavy feeling was still in this guest bedroom with this furniture. As our arguing gets worse, I feel their presence all the time and catch glimpses of someone or something in mirrors, in reflections of glass, and in my dreams. I always felt watched and looked over. I start getting sleep paralysis, and this entity that looks like a young adult woman with long, dark hair starts in the corner of my room and eventually weighs down on my chest and suffocates me. I wake up gasping for air multiple times and eventually get a bruise on my chest. I catch it in the reflection of the TV the next day and feel like I can't breathe. I mention this weird experience to my massage therapist, who's very spiritual, and she shuddered when she touched my chest and described the entity exactly as I saw it in the reflections and my sleep paralysis. It's been a year now, and my dad and I have mended. The presence remains in the guest bedroom and always will until my dad gets rid of this attachment to this ghost, I think. He knows that he has a ghost attached to him, but he lives peacefully with it. My witch friend gave me a protection ball and ways to seal off the guest bedroom, and since then, it has left me alone. She asked me to do a ritual, asking it what it wants with a pen and paper, but I'm even more scared to see the response. I'm a truckie mainly do all road train work from Brisbane up around the top of Australia to Perth and along the Nullarbor, seen some strange shit but nothing like this mate. I never really ventured into Victoria and NSW due to scalies and revenue raising, but I had to do an express run to Melbourne via Sydney and had to come back up the Newell Highway to collect a load for Toowoomba. My boss said I don't mind if you pull up before you get around Coonabarabran, as some drivers choose not to go through at night, with a giggle in his voice. I said, ah, she'll be right, mate. Plenty of hours left, all good, so I hooked in. I was in between Coonabarabran and Narrabri, and Ashila, out of nowhere, flagged me down hitchhiking looking to go home to her camp, and I thought, WTF is this shit? I said, hop in, and the hair stood up all over my body with an instant thought I should have kept going. She stunk like nothing I had smelled before, and the cab was destroyed with stench. She didn't say a word and just gazed ahead. About 20 kilometers down the road and not passing one vehicle, the old woman said here, this is it, and I had to stop in a gully, and off she went with a bag, no thanks, nothing. I looked around, but there was not a ducking thing on sight with no lights, tracks, or anything. I was glad she was gone because my gut was almost ready to explode. I pulled up on the other side of Narrabri for a few hours and decided to get going at daybreak, but I had to sleep in the trailer because the smell was horrible. I woke up to another truckie kicking his tires doing a pre-start, and I climbed out, to which he replied, duck mate, they're working you pretty hard. I continued to explain the cabs absolutely stinking from the hitchhiker lady, and he went pale white and told me exactly where it happened. I said yes, mate, and he said yes, mate, that nutter was run over back in 1993 by a truck. I gulped and thought, duck me, what is going on? Is this ducker for real? This was in 2014, and to this day, I have never been anywhere near that part of NSW. The pillage of princess is real, for sure. I told the boss, and he laughed and said, there's a coldies in the fridge, so hurry the duck up. He showed me the camera in the truck, which shows the passenger door open and close by itself as I'm looking across talking, but nothing on the video of her just thin air. She has this friend whom she and her mom are very witchy with. Her mother is a scary scary woman. They had this extremely big and expensive house. I went and stayed with them one summer probably like 17 to 18. We get there, and the house is wonderful. They are bringing us through all the rooms, and we get to this one room where they tell us never to open it. Like, come on. Fast forward a week. No one has gone in. But all the bathrooms in the house are being used. Except for the one that's in this room. So I think nothing of it. Go in, get to the bathroom, and start taking a leak. Now. When I told you, I felt this absolutely chilling thing grab my shoulder, and it was big. I feel fingers down the front of my chest while it's sitting on my shoulder. I freeze. After what seemed like forever, I heard my name, clicked back to reality, 
finished my business, and walked out. I found out I was in there for over 40 minutes. Fast forward a few more days. I go out to stand in the pool at, like, 1130 at night. Standing in the pool with my phone, I know, dumb idea, when it happens again. Something grabs my shoulder, and I freeze. I dropped my phone straight in the water and apparently stood there for over two hours till someone came out and found me. To this day. Now almost 30, I still probably do it twice a year, not for hours at a time but only for a few minutes, it still happens. When I was a little kid, my family moved to the hills of West Virginia and lived in a small house that was built in the 20s. I hated this house, specifically my room. My room was set up so that my bed was in a corner and my closet was directly across from my bed. Facing the closet, to the right, was a doorway with no door leading into a playroom. The door to leave my room was to the left of my closet on the wall where my bed was. Every night, I sat there, staring at my closet door. My dog, who is a bigger husky, Shepherd, would lay at the door whining to get out of my room as I made her stay with me, which she never did in any other room, even when she needed to go outside. My fearless dog hates being in my room. After a while, the fear didn't get any better. I would beg my parents to let me stay at my grandparents' house, which was next door, or for my dad to stay in my room with me until I fell asleep. I had never had trouble going to sleep on my own, so my parents thought this was just some way to get attention or something. Well, one night, all of this fear and everything else came to a head. I was lying in my bed, pillows stacked up so I wouldn't have to see my closet door, hiding under the covers. I heard my dog yelp. This being odd, I peeked out of the covers and saw nothing. As soon as I laid back down, I heard the handle fall off of my old closet door. The handle falling off wasn't something new, as it was only a front knob and a rod and was found on the floor quite frequently. No one thought a thing of it and would just pick it up and place it back in the hole. When I heard the knob fall, I terrifyingly looked over, and neither I nor anyone else had ever actually seen it fall before. Since the door was old, the knob kept the mechanism latched so the door wouldn't open. Since the knob was out, the door creaked open like in a horror movie. At this point, I was so scared that I couldn't move, scream, or do anything. My dog at this point was whining very loudly, but not loud enough for my parents in their room to hear. Then she stopped. Just stopped. I looked at the open closet door and saw a small, frail boy with a very large head. All of him was black except for where his eyes should be. He slowly turned and looked at me, and I didn't feel fear, I felt devastation. I felt the most extreme anger, sadness, and intense emotions I have ever felt. It wasn't natural. After what seemed like forever, I bolted out of my room, sobbing, and ran to my parents. My parents never let me sleep with them, so my father took me back to bed and waited until I fell asleep. From then on, I would throw actual fits if I wasn't allowed to stay the night at my grandparents. On nights I had to stay home, this same experience would happen every single night. I wouldn't sleep if I stayed at my house, so my parents gave in and let me stay with my grandparents most nights. It got to the point where my mom was telling my godmother what was happening, and she offered to bless the room as she was a devout Catholic. After this, things got better for about a week, and then they all collapsed into the same horror show every night. My parents aren't very religious, but they eventually decided to test it out for themselves. My mother stayed in my room one night and decided that we needed to move the next day. I've never seen that little boy again, but the thought of it brings me to tears. I don't know what it was. I believe in the supernatural. It's kind of hard for me not to. I wasn't the only one to experience this. My old house was tested for any kind of leak or slow poisoning and was clear. After selling it, we found out that the people who lived there refused to use that room, which I found interesting because they never knew what had happened. My dad's story, not mine. In the early 1980s, he was working a summer job at Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming. One day, he and his friend Mark hiked up to the top of one of the mountains. They set up their tent inside an Indian pit, a man-made hole dug out by Native Americans hundreds of years ago. The Indian pits were either used as hunting blinds or spots where young braves came to for their vision quest. Late in the night, my dad wakes up and has to use the bathroom, number one. He crawled out of the tent, out of the pit, and went walking a respectable distance away from the tent. Suddenly, he felt a hand on his shoulder pull him backward. My dad calls out, Hey Mark, what are you doing? He turns around, turns on his flashlight, and there is nobody there. He shines the light at his feet and discovers that his next couple steps would have taken him directly over a steep cliff. He did his business and hurried back to the tent. The next morning, the two friends are waking up, and his buddy says to him, I know this sounds crazy, but I woke up in the middle of the night, and I swear to you, 
there was an Indian man standing outside our tent. Whatever really happened that night, my dad is alive, he met my mom in Yellowstone, and here I am writing this story to you today. This happened about two years ago and still gives my friends and me chills whenever we think of it. We were having camp, it was a three-day, two-night camp in the church. On the second night, we were all very exhausted and tired from the sports activities we had, as well as the sessions given throughout the day. We went to our room at around 11.30 p.m. to get a good night's sleep. About two hours passed by, and one of my close friends and I could not sleep, so we decided to write Thanksgiving letters to our friends, campmates, and fellow camp instructors. When we finished writing them, we had to go out of the room and place them inside the wall of envelopes down the hallway. There were around 12 rooms on the level, and this particular hallway had a room to itself, roughly 10 meters down. On these walls were the envelopes, and we placed them inside as fast as possible. We were terrified. We rushed back into our room and still couldn't fall asleep. Being guys, we talked about guy things and joked around. My friend jokingly said, Hey man, wouldn't it be funny if we put our flashlight against the window? There was a huge window right across from where our sleeping bags were. So, being a restless idiot, I did as he asked. At first, we weren't scared, as we were inside the church. But to our horror, we saw a pair of handprints on the window. We were on the fifth floor. There were no constructions whatsoever. The position of the window was impossible to reach by any human without a rope from the higher floor or a ladder from the first floor. My friend and I shed ourselves, we woke everybody else up, and we all saw it. It doesn't end there. I mustered up the courage to go up to the window and tried to rub it off, it was on the other side of the window. I then compared the hand size to my palm. I am around 5 feet 9 inches, and my hands are pretty big, the size of the handprint was almost the size of a toddler. Terrified, I lunged back to the corner where my friends and I resided due to fear. We prayed the whole five decades of the Holy Rosary, and the handprint slowly disappeared upon completion of the Rosary. Today, this has become one of our fondest memories and has made us closer than before. I guess bonding over fear makes a strong friendship. I was camping in the 80s on Bluff Mountain between the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Punchbowl Shelter. This area is part of the Appalachian Trail. Basically, you can camp anywhere off the dirt roads or trails. We were camped about halfway up Bluff Mountain for a week. The second to last day, we decided to do the day hike up to the top of Bluff Mountain, taking our time to explore on the way up. When we got to the top, we saw the old fire tower foundations, did some exploring, and found the Adi Klein Powell Memorial. Remember, this is the late 80s, no internet, so a stumbling around and finding this powerful memorial where a child had died a hundred years before us was profound. We stayed for a bit, reflecting on the story and talking about it, then hiked back down the mountain to our camp. That night at our camp, we slept outside our tents because the weather was beautiful and it was our last night. The three of us slept in our sleeping bags lined up next to the fire, a few feet in between each other. We dozed off to sleep. Every night, like clockwork at around 3 a.m., we could hear a train whistle way off in the distance. It was kind of cool because if you happen to be awake, those of you who have roughed it understand that sleeping in tents or sleeping bags isn't the most restful sleep, you knew that the sun would be up in a few hours, and you had a sense of what time it was. I was stirring in my sleeping bag right after I heard the train whistle when I heard something coming. When you camp in places like this, you can hear the slightest sounds at night because there is nothing but animal movement, bugs, etc. I reached over and smacked my buddy on the leg to alert him that something was coming. Keep in mind that it's pitch black in the forest in the middle of the night. Our fire was nothing but a few small embers, so the light it provided was minimal. I wake up my buddy, as the noise is really loud and heading right at us. Noise stops, and standing directly in front of us in our camp in the middle of the night were two men with shotguns and a lantern. They were dressed in overalls and wearing boots and hats. Shotguns were lowered, but still, they had shotguns on us in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. I had the only weapon we brought with us in my hand in my sleeping bag, a CO2 powered pellet gun, which would have had little effect on two guys with shotguns. We brought it to keep animals away. All three of us were shitting bricks out of our minds at this point, and it was like a standoff. Who's going to flinch first? They shined their lantern at us, and we stared at them, waiting for those guns to be raised, which was silently understood by us, that if that happens, all hells break loose and probably not going to end well for us, without a word spoken by us or them they turned around and walked off. None of us spoke to each other until the noise of their movement was far away. We immediately got up off the ground, had a brief what the duck just happened conversation, and made the decision right there in the middle of the night to pack up and hike down to our car. We were off that mountain before sunrise. Years later, 
I began researching the story behind the memorial and the child who had died on that mountain. I spoke with a few local historians, and they had me speak to a professor down that way who was writing a book about the events of Adi Klein Powell's and his family's history in the area. It was he who told me that he thinks we had a direct encounter with the ghosts of that mountain, an idea that had never crossed my mind. I assumed they were moonshiners or poachers who checked us out, they saw we were young men and no threat, so they moved on. This professor believes we had a ghost encounter because, in his research, he found many similar stories from others in that area over the years. Apparently, as the story goes, search parties worked those mountains day and night looking for this kid who was missing back in 1887 or 88. The professor believes we had one of these encounters with the ghosts of the mountain, still looking for the boy. I'm a truck driver and normally deliver groceries to small, one-off grocery stores in the middle of nowhere. I was delivering to a store somewhere north of Gallup, New Mexico. I was scheduled to deliver at 5 a.m. I made it there the night before, so I pulled around to the back of the store to get a little sleep. I woke up a few hours later because I had to piss. It was completely black in the truck. A complete absence of light. No vision at all. This is not unusual because I have blacked out curtains in there so that I can sleep during the day without light messing with me. I sat forward from the bed to unzip the curtain. And damn near fell forward. The curtains were already open, I had never closed them when I went to sleep. I felt my way to the front of the truck to look out the windows. Completely black. I couldn't see inside the truck, and I couldn't see outside the truck. It's like I was blind. I felt my way to the door handle, and when I opened the door, the inside lights felt brighter than the sun compared to the darkness. I took a second to be happy I wasn't blind, and then I stepped out to piss. It was totally black outside. My dome lights were barely cutting through it, maybe two feet from the door and windows. I couldn't see the ground. I couldn't see the sky. I couldn't see the store I know I parked right next to. Not even halfway through pissing, I got this overwhelming feeling to run away. It was a really dreadful feeling. I went up on the balls of my feet involuntarily, like my body was going to take off running without waiting on my brain to decide. I jumped back in the truck and locked the doors. I started it up and cut on the lights, the brights, and the chicken lights. All that just let me see maybe 5 feet in front and nothing but the lights on the sides. I crept out of that lot and back to the road. A couple of miles later, it started looking like normal outside. I could see it like any other night. I drove back down to Gallup and parked in a lit up Walmart parking lot, but I didn't go back to that store until the sun came up. Not me, but my mother. Her parents rented an old church house, and they used to come down to the kitchen every morning and find the cellar door open. Eventually, Grandpa got fed up with it and bolted it shut. The next morning, the bolt was undone and the door was open. The previous tenants were related, so they asked them if it ever happened to them, and they said it did, and even tying the door shut with rope didn't stop it. Fast forward a few months, and my grandparents are out at the pub on New Year's Eve, so my mom and her siblings decide to watch the door. Around 11 p.m., they hear heavy footsteps coming up the steps and a dragging chain sound. The dog was the first one to run away, and as the footsteps got closer, eventually they all ran and hit upstairs. Eventually, my grandparents came home, and the kids finally came downstairs. The door was open. The dog refused to come down until the next day. Years later, I decided to look up the house, and it was still there. No one lived there anymore, so I quickly peeked into the kitchen window, and there was a massive pile of furniture in front of the cellar door. I could just see the top of the door over the pile, and it was slightly open. I used to babysit my niece and nephew when they were four and five while my sister went to work. She lived down the street from me, so I would walk down in the morning before she left and before the kids woke up. I got there one morning, and after she left, I laid down on the couch. I heard one of the kids run down the hall, and I immediately pretended to be asleep so they would go back to bed and not get the day started yet. I felt my niece run by me on the couch. Her running stomp shook the floor, and I could hear the trinkets on the shelves shake. And I felt the wind blow by. Then it was quiet, but I knew she was still there. She leaned over my ear, moved my hair out of the way, and laughed in my ear. And I just thought of the audacity of this girl. And then she hid under the end table of the couch. Realizing she wasn't going to go back to bed until I woke up, I just got up and looked under the end table. There was no one there. I was completely baffled at how she got up and out of the living room in literally two seconds without my hearing. It shook me. So I went down the hall to her room and was starting to freak out. My nephew was sound asleep in his bedroom, and when I got to my niece's room, she was sound asleep, tucked under her covers. My heart almost fell out of my body. I stayed in a haunted B&B in Sweden many times, near our Swedish division HQ, a small USA-based corporation. 
we had heard the stories of four different entities, the former owner and his aide, the little girl and her guardian. None of the stories were malicious, but only helpful or playful encounters with people for over 100 years. One night, I was carrying my folded laundry up to my room. When I got to the top of the stairs, the owner's cat was sniffing under the hallway door leading to my room. Gustav, the cat, suddenly bolted into the owner's wing of the house. Very unlike him, as he was really friendly. My hands were full, so I was going to use my elbow for the L-shaped door handle. When I went for the handle, it turned, and the door opened before I touched it. The hallway was dark, but the light switch was immediately to my right. Before I even moved towards it, the switch moved and the lights came on. Realizing what was happening, all I could do was say thank you out loud to the entity. A crew of four co-workers had an hour-long encounter with two other entities there. Big, macho construction guys. All four took off, scared shitless, finding their own ways back to the USA, one was not heard from for four months. I was a VP, so I did their interviews. Each told the same story, each had extreme PTSD, and each one of them quit the company. This happened to me when I was 9, 2010. My friend in the neighborhood found a Ouija board in his brother's stuff while he was away at college. He told me what it was and asked me if I wanted to play it with him. Trying to impress him, I said yes, and we went into his room and tried it out. Nothing happened, and we were left disappointed. Later that week, he called me and told me that he looked up how to use the board properly and wanted to give it another go. I agreed, as I was more confident that nothing would happen. So we grabbed a bunch of scented candles, placed them around the board, and did the whole seance stuff. We asked the board if anyone was there, and it, of course, went to yes. We thought the other was messing around, but we agreed to take it seriously because I didn't really care if it was a stupid joke. We asked the ghost what its name was, and it spelled out Owen. My friend asked if it was a person, and it went to no. We asked what it was, and it spelled out demon. I was then asked to prove it. You know the call in the intro to finding Bigfoot? Well, that's the closest thing to what we heard from the garage. Keep in mind that it was only us in the house. It scared the shit out of us, and we ran out of the house. We checked the garage and found nothing. Anyway, a few weeks go by, and he tells me how he is having paranormal experiences. He feels like he is being watched whenever he is downstairs in the kitchen and living room. He feels someone sitting at the end of his bed every night. Every time he walks past the garage, he feels someone grab his wrist and pull it towards the garage. Whenever I went over, I always got the feeling that someone was looking at me from the ceiling. It was definitely unnatural. Then came the scariest part of all. We were at his house playing army in his room while no one else was home when we began to hear heavy footsteps downstairs, except whatever was making it had hooves. It sounded like a full-grown horse was walking around downstairs. Then we heard someone begin to laugh and cough at the same time. My friend ran over and slammed the door shut, and we hid. He hid under his bed, while I hid in his closet. Then it sounded like someone began scratching his door with one big claw, like the ones raptors had on their big toe. He started crying, and I was on the verge of tears. My friend yelled, leave us alone, Owen. You're scaring us. It began to stop, and then we heard it run down the stairs. My friend got up, threw me out of the closet, and grabbed the Ouija board that was in there with me. He ran down the stairs, ripped the screen door off of his gas fireplace, threw the thing in there, put the screen back on, and went to turn it on. When he was about to turn it on, we heard a loud moan from the basement, which was right behind my friend. He flicked the fireplace on, and the board began to burn. That was the end of that, and we played outside since he was too scared to go back into the house until his parents got home. His parents came home and saw that he had burned his brother's Ouija board. They grounded him and threw the burned board away. That was the end of the paranormal experiences at my friend's house. And that's why I will never take part in one of those games again. I live in the woods in Florida, I'm 13 miles from the nearest anything, and that's a gas station, I'm 25 miles from the nearest town, my only neighbors for 2 miles are my parents, who live across the street from me. I'm a single mom, it's just me and my son out here, and our dogs. So I'm home from work early-ish one night, and my son had built his nest on the couch and passed out early, like 8 p.m., so I had time to myself and a sleeping child, so I decided to play some Skyrim uninterrupted for once. I'm playing my game, smoking my bowl, and just having a great time when I hear my pit bull, Ares, bark. It's not a bunch of barking, just one, insistent, hey mom, you left me out and I want to come and bark. Any pet owner should be nodding their head right now. We all know our pet's voices. I pause and look at the time, and I say out loud, it's only 830, you're fine, it's a beautiful night out anyway, and I go back to my game. 
about half an hour later, he barks again. Just that one hey mom, you left me out here bark interrupts my concentration, and I ignore the urge to get up and let him in. I continue playing because I don't get much time to work 50 hours a week and take care of my kid and house when I'm not working. I'm mid a dungeon quest, and I'm concentrating hard, but about every 15 minutes I hear the one stupid bark, and I start to get really annoyed because every time he does it, I get the literal urge to go let him in, and it just tips me out of my train of thought and ruins my game immersion, and I'm starting to get angry, if I wanted to let you in, I'd let you in, but you're fiving. Finally, he does it one last time. Most moms know what I mean, I had had enough, so I toss down my controller, thinking how stupid this dog is, and as it hits the pile of covers next to me my kid is buried in, I hear a snore, a dog snore, and I move the blanket to see Aries, dead asleep next to my kid, not a care in his dumb doggy brain. Immediate fear, dread, and heaviness like I've never felt washed over me. I can't describe it any better than an ancient fear, it felt old and terrifying, and I literally heard a voice say in my head, don't move, baby, don't get up, just keep playing like you don't know anything is wrong and it will go away. If you take one step towards that door, you're in trouble. I picked my controller back up and kept playing. I heard the bark a few more times, but around 1145, the air in my house felt normal again, but I slept out on the couch because I wasn't leaving my kid alone. I was driving across the country with my mom and sister. I was 16, my sister was 20, and my mom was in her 50s. It was late, but we were well rested and alert. We were driving along an interstate and needed gas, and they needed to pee, so we stopped at the only rest stop in 200 miles. There was a van full of teenagers on some road trip and a small grey compact car, like a Honda Accord or some shit, parked at the pump in front of us. Two men, about 17 to 20, were standing outside the Honda in hoodies, statue ducking still. The teenagers were to our left. When we got there, everything felt wrong. There was a deep and unsettling feeling about the place, and we'd not felt that way at any other rest stop. We'd been on the road for days and seen many rest stops at night, and we had never been afraid until then. My mom and sister went inside, and I stayed in the car. I heard the teenagers say they were creeped out and couldn't get the pump to work, and they left in a hurry. I was mostly watching the car in front and the two men, who had still not moved at all. Not an inch. They weren't talking. They weren't on phones. There was no light anywhere but the dim overhead lights on the gas station awning. They were just ducking standing there, still as stones. My sister and mom came running back out to the car, and when they got in, the two men slowly turned to look at us while not moving or pivoting the rest of their bodies, and I swear to ducking shit, we all saw the same thing, they had eyes as dark as pitch and empty. Truly empty. Not black, not reflecting any light at all, just a ducking void. We booked it. We have not traveled in excess of 100 miles per hour before or since, but duck, that day it was warranted. We drove until we were in the next city before we got out of the car again. And you know the worst ducking thing about it? Not the eyes, not the stillness, not that horrible feeling, not the weirdo in the gas station who kept telling my mom and sister, my mama will like you, over and over while mopping the same spot on the floor with a dry mop and an empty bucket. It was the fact that we couldn't find the place on any map. We knew exactly which spot on the interstate to look, and we couldn't ducking find it on Google Maps or any paper map we had. We even asked locals about the creepy gas station out on that stretch of road to confuse looks, and are you sure you weren't traveling on, highway, and not, interstate? We'd traveled on that interstate since then, and there was. No. Rest stop. My daughter saw a man dressed in a top hat and suit standing in our living room, looking out our windows. She thought it was someone who had come to visit us. He had his back to her. She said he looked like he was from the Oregon Trail or something. I took care of my friend's house while he was in hospice and later after he passed away. I had been in his house many times. Once, he took me into his bedroom to show me some firearms he owned. He had to step out for a few minutes. While he was away, I could smell what seemed like someone smoking a pipe. Neither my friend nor his wife were smokers. After his widow moved away, I took care of the house until it was sold. Most times I was in that room, I could smell the pipe, like someone had recently smoked in the room. When the house sold, his widow came back, and she and I met at the house to go over a few things. She told me that she knew the house was haunted. She told me that most nights when her husband was away, she'd wake up in the middle of the night to the smell of burning tobacco. She said after a while she'd yell, old man, put that nasty thing out. And the smell would immediately go away. She figured it was the previous owner of the house, who happened to be an old man who lived there alone until he passed away. I had never told her about what I smelled when I was in there. 
From the time I was about 12 to 17 years old, I lived in what I believe was a haunted house. I've never had experiences like I had in that house since moving out. A few specific memories come to mind. Once, I was hanging up laundry in my closet. I heard someone whisper my name in my ear, clear as day. I'd never sprinted out of a room so fast. Another time, my sister and I had friends over, and we decided to use a tape recorder to ask questions to the ghosts like they do on those paranormal shows. We played the tape, not expecting to hear anything, and could hear a very soft voice say, I'm in the closet. We were sitting near a small closet in the basement. My parents eventually decided to sell the house. We moved to a new place before selling it. My sister stopped by the house after there had been a couple of showings to turn out the lights in the house. She went to turn off the lights in the basement, which had multiple light switches. One was at the far end of the basement, away from the stairs. She turned off the light and swears she heard heavy footfalls from someone running towards her. She ran out of the house without turning out the rest of the lights, and she locked the door. That was the last time either of us went back until we were in the neighborhood, and the new owners offered to show us the renovations they made. Nothing happened then, but they did ask us if we wanted to babysit their kids. We politely declined. I was 9 to 11 years old. My family lived in a three-bedroom duplex. I had my own room across from my mother's room, down a short hallway. My older brother's room was on the opposite side of the house. For the full three to four years that we lived there, I couldn't sleep facing my wall. Anytime I fell asleep or attempted to while facing the wall, I would feel someone smack me in the back of the head with their hand. At first, I thought this was my older brother being an ass until it happened while my very loud, squeaky door was shut. It also happened for the six plus months he was in juvie. My mother does not move quickly or quietly, and it even happened while I had a friend stay the night, but only to me, and only when I tried to sleep facing the wall. So one night, my door was left open when I went to bed. I was fast asleep on my back when I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night and had the feeling that someone was standing above me. I looked up to see a long, soft, blue light suspended 6 to 12 inches above the floor in the center of the straight hallway between my mom's room and mine. I was upside down, so after about a minute of staring at this soft blue light, I turned over. After a few seconds, I noticed that there's a slim, middle-aged man floating there, covered in blue light. He's making eye contact with me, and his face is expressionless. He's just staring down at me. I'd never seen him before, but it didn't scare me for some reason. About 10 uninterrupted minutes of just staring at each other. Somehow, while looking at him, I fall back asleep. I never saw that man again. However, until the day I moved out, I could not sleep facing the wall, or I would be woken with a quick smack to the back of the head in the middle of the night. No one believed me, of course. I live in upstate New York, and my family owns around 10 acres of land surrounded by fields and woods. I have always had experiences growing up in this house. Maybe more stories are to come, but anyway. It was late at night, close to 1 to 2 a.m., when this occurred. I have a window at the end of my bed that has an AC in it. It's about 8 feet from my window to the grass below. My cat, Hudson, loves to jump up on open windows and lay across and press against the screen. This night, he had decided to jump up on that open window. I had totally forgotten the screen on my window was out due to the AC. I didn't realize this until I heard Hudson hissing and screeching at something outside the window. I assumed it was some sort of animal, maybe a raccoon, and tried to call him in. Suddenly, he fell out of the window and started screeching. I have never heard him make a sound like this before and jump out of bed to go outside and get him. I went to my little brother's room to have him help me go find my cat. I was really nervous because he's gotten out before and has been missing for days on end, so my fear of the dark was thrown out the window in this moment. I had my flashlight on, sprinted out the door, and went to the side of the house where my window was. I made the turn and shined my flashlight on the area. What I saw was not my cat but a 7-8 foot figure trying to scale the walls of my house and reach into my open window. One of the creature's back legs were pressed against the house while the front legs had a hold of my wind sill. The creature noticed my flashlight and looked in my direction. It had deep red eyes that kept me frozen in my spot. The creature stared me straight in the eyes and proceeded to let go of the house and move towards the field on the side. But it didn't go on all fours. Whatever this thing was, it stood on its back legs and ran quickly into the field. In the darkness, I was able to make out what looked like a set of horns or antlers on this thing's head. Its height on its back legs was at least 7 to 8 feet tall, and it did not look at all like a human. Its posture was slightly hunched over, and its arms swayed to the side of it as it moved. They hung close to the level of what I guess would be its knees. My little brother was in the front of the house looking for my cat, so I went to grab him and help me look in the field the creature ran into. At this point, 
I think my adrenaline was going so fast that I didn't completely process what I had seen. We got close to the field and saw absolutely nothing, no cat or creature. We made our way back to the front to look for my cat on the other side of the house. Without saying anything, my brother and I froze. We both looked towards the trees and bushes at the side of the house and saw them rustling. We heard this painfully loud shrieking, and we booked it to the front door. I have no idea if what we heard was that creature or some other animal, but I had an awful gut feeling standing in that driveway. It wasn't safe, and I couldn't have my brother out there. I locked the door quickly and went to the back porch sliding door, where I saw my cat waiting at the door to be let in. He is the type to escape and be out for days with no issue. He has never just come to the back door after getting out. He looked scared. His tail was the bushiest I have ever seen, and the poor thing was shaking. He ran inside and stayed away from the windows and doors for the rest of the night. I lived in my childhood home until I was 20, and I lived there with roommates for a year as well. It's always been an active home, but it definitely got more active once roommates moved in. Lots of different energies pushed together under one roof can definitely do that. One night, my boyfriend had a friend over to play video games. I was hanging out with my best friend or roommate. My boyfriend and his friend decided to go get some food around midnight, my friend and I stayed home. None of our other roommates were home. We were sitting at the kitchen counter, right next to the front door. We heard voices approaching the door after about an hour of my boyfriend being gone. The motion sensor light came on outside as well. It sounded like two male voices talking to each other. Eventually, the light went out, but the voices continued. We were confused about why they hadn't come in yet. While making some jokes, my friend proceeded to open the door and check who it was. Nobody was there. No cars were outside. Confused, it took us a few minutes to understand what was happening. We walked around the perimeter of the house, nobody. I called my boyfriend, he was a 10 minute drive away. That was when we started thinking about it. We knew that there were spirits in the house, but not much else. We always joked that it was two male energies, one was playful and a trickster, and the other was scarier and liked to scare us. We once had a conversation about how the spirits couldn't be female because none of us felt a female presence, only male. At one point, we even assumed it might just be one spirit, but now we know it's two male spirits because we heard them with our own ears. I used to work at this radio station in New Mexico, which was listed as one of the most haunted places in the state. It was in an old house that had been converted into offices. The story goes that the last owner of the house made a living by carving gravestones in the basement, and that he died while working on one. When the new owners of the building took over, they left the stone where it was. That was a mistake. I heard stories from some people who worked there back then. Shadowy figures are seen in unoccupied rooms. Lights are going on and off for no apparent reason. Supposedly, all the activity died down when the stone was moved out of there. Well, most of it. When I worked there, the outline of the stone was still there on the basement floor, and as I worked the night shift, I saw some weird shit. For starters, the door to the basement was in the break room, and in order to get to the vending machine, you had to walk by the door. Most of the time, it was no big deal, but on occasion, I would start to walk past, and this terrifying feeling came over me. The hair on my neck and arms stood up, and it was all I could do not to run out of there. Then one night, I went out into the offices and turned off all the lights. You know, save electricity, and whatnot. I went back into the studio to keep doing my show. A little while later, I walked out and saw that all the lights were back on. There was nobody else in the building. There were also a couple of times when I watched CD players open and close on their own, which brought me to the freakiest story, told to me by the overnight guy. He was doing his show, playing the new Bon Jovi song off the album, and the lights flickered for a moment. When he looked down at the display on the CD player, it was showing a different track as playing, though the song he'd been playing kept going. We pulled out the album and looked for the track that was indicated as playing. It was a song called I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. This happened back around 2009. I have a little brother who was born in 2008. Growing up, I'd always have weird things happen to me. For example, I'd be in my room, and I'd hear knocking at my door. I went to check, and no one was there. One time I heard knocking coming from the mirror, and I brushed it off because I was young and didn't know what paranormal was. When my brother was about 18 months old, my grandparents flew to where we were. That's when things got weirder. One day, my grandma was sleeping. She had woken up screaming, and when we rushed to the room she was in, she was hysterical. Praying, screaming, and crying. We had asked what was wrong, and all she could say was my brother's name. Over and over. So we all rushed to his room in fear that something had happened to him. He was okay. 
sleeping peacefully. My grandfather comforted my grandmother, and we waited until she fell back asleep. My mom, dad, and I went to the living room, sat down, and just didn't know what to say. I kid you not, about 20 minutes later, we heard a voice coming from my brother's baby monitor. It was like a whisper. We looked at each other in shock and checked the camera. There was nothing. We checked on my brother, he was sleeping, then went back to the living room, thinking we were crazy. Five minutes later, we had settled down and turned on the TV. My dad had just fallen asleep when we heard a voice, like a deep growl from the baby monitor. It was loud and very scary. My mother screamed, and in the exact moment she screamed, my brother's door slammed shut, my grandma started screaming, my dad ran to my brother's room, and my brother began crying. My dad couldn't get the door open. Eventually, he broke the door down, and everything went quiet. My brother was just looking at my dad, my grandma was whispering prayers, and my mom was still crying. At the age I was, I didn't know what had just happened. We ended up going to my uncle's house, who was, at the time, and still is, a pastor. My brother and I were outside with my cousins playing. We were babysitting him. Being kids, we weren't the best of babysitters, and shortly after, we couldn't find my brother. We had run to our parents crying, and they had become frantic. The kids looked outside, and the parents were inside searching. My uncle's house was two stories. There was the basement, which had been converted into a living room. The ground floor, and the second floor. My cousin had looked up to the second floor and, sure enough, saw my baby brother in the window of the bathroom. Climbing out onto the roof. I don't know if it's classed as a roof to be fair. It was kind of like one, but it was just some tiling that went out under the second floor windows, as a means of cover from rain if you were to walk out under them. We yelled, and I ran straight to the bathroom. My grandfather came with me, and we both couldn't open the door. I stood back to let my grandfather try, and then I heard a female voice on the other side. Very subtle, very easy to miss. I just caught it. So I bent down, peeked under the door, and saw what seemed to be a black figure at the window. My grandfather had just managed to open the door, and when he did, there was no one. He had reached out, grabbed my brother, and ran downstairs. Eventually, all of us kids had to go inside. We went to the living room with all the adults and sat down. My uncle, the pastor, had begun to pray. We had a family prayer, and my uncle had noticed my baby brother's behavior. After our family prayer, my uncle began to pray over my brother. I watched my baby brother squirm. I never understood it. He was wailing, crying. I was squirming as if my uncle's words were physically cutting through him. Eventually, after what seemed to be years, my baby brother stopped moving. Everyone just stared at him. Then we heard him cry. Just a normal cry. My mom started crying, and my dad began, thanking my uncle. It has never been spoken about again, but it has always lived with me. My brother is now turning 14 and has no recollection of this whatsoever. To this day, I wonder what it was, or whom it was exactly, that wanted my brother and what had driven it to choose him. So there I was, a seven-year-old kid in rural Utah. I was staying the night at my grandparents' house on Main Street. I didn't want to sleep, so around midnight I went down into the basement. I took my matchbox cars and played Night City with my glowing better blocks. I had this little metropolis going on when my uncle came down to play with me. Should I mention that my great-uncle died when I was two? Well, he did. Anyway, my great-uncle and I played Night City for a good hour. I remember it like it was yesterday. He drove the Lincoln because that was his favorite car. Anyway, it got late, and he had to leave so he wouldn't miss his train. He left, and I went to sleep. The next morning, I asked when uncle was coming back to play again. My grandparents were slightly offended that I picked it up. They hadn't seen him since before I was born and wanted nothing to do with him. He was the black sheep of the family. I told him, and I played cars and showed them the car that he drove in our city. They were uncomfortable with this and chalked it up to my imagination. I never met my uncle. Again, he died when I was two. Over the years since then, I have learned that he drove both a train, for Union Pacific, and a Lincoln Mkvai. Like I said, I don't believe in ghosts, but I don't know how seven-year-old me knew things about an estranged relative who died when I was two and was never spoken of due to certain family issues. To this day, I don't know what happened that night, but I remember playing Night City with some guy who said he was my uncle like it was yesterday. He was super nice, and at the end of the game, he simply left out the back door. <laughs>